Welcome back, everybody. I am Mark Fernandez. I'm joined today by one of my heroes, Brandon Braga, director, producer, uh, showrunner, basically um, for folks that are not hyper aware of him already, you know, pretty much the father of every single nerd instinct you've had. Brandon, so, so much. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Um, my story with you actually started at NYU. And I don't know if you remember this or if you had anything to do with this, even though they claimed uh, when I was there that, that, that you were a contributor to the school. I never met you then, but long story short, when I was at NYU, this is back in the late 90s, because um, I graduated in 98, so this must have been like 96 or something. Um, my, my screenwriting professor uh, gave us an assignment and you know they told us this great story about how, how Star Trek um, takes in uh, screenplays from the public and you know like that many writers were able to submit work and it was like an open submission policy. So as one of our uh, uh, final assignments for, um, for the NYU screenwriting course um, in my sophomore year, was to create our own version of Star Trek. And, um, you know, once, and that was my ex first exposure to Star Trek, because before then I was all about Michelangelo Antonioni and Igmar Bergman and, and you know, Akira Kurosawa. And to me, Star Trek, that was for little kids. Like, you know, like I wanted nothing to do with Star Trek. And then um, my, my, my first exposure to Star Trek was um, Star Trek Voyager. Um, which which is usually not at people's first entry point into Star Trek. Depends. And, it depends on depends on how old you were at the time, you know. Exactly, and and I will never forget falling in love with that show over and over again as I was preparing myself for this uh, you know for this assignment and kept seeing the name Brandon Braga, Brandon Braga, Brandon Braga, and that name has followed me pretty much through my entire life, you know. So. This is a huge honor for me to get to speak to you, sir. So thank you very oh, much for doing this. It's, 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 the honor is all mine. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I had a some my I was coming. I went to film school at UC Santa Cruz. I mm. got accepted into N at Tisch at NYU. Yeah, yeah. But I couldn't afford the cost of living in New York. Yeah, it was expensive. So I actually didn't go. Right. Right. Um, and um but i've always kind of worshipped the nyu film program from afar uh because of you know all of the its pedigree and and its cool factor and uh but when i was in film school same thing i mean it was all about bergman and Hitchcock <laughs> right. and, uh, and, and masters you know beautiful filmmakers oh, st but and then got an internship at star trek the next generation and it had a similar experience to you which was this show's great right, right. Um, right. Uh, and um at that time i mean i remember watching the pilot the very first episode of next generation in 1987 encounter at far point was the yeah, legendary think, piece of television that was my fact you know because i had seen some of the movies and really enjoyed those and i remember watching the pilot and thinking ah this isn't for me but then Right around the time I started there, um, I was hearing the word on the street was, no, ne you should watch next, this show Next Generation. It's really good now. It's getting good. Right. So I came in at right, <laughs> I, came, I, I was very lucky that I came in at, at the right time. And uh, you, you, um, you came into Next Generation uh, in nineteen ninety four ish, was that? No, 90, 1990. 90, 90. And um, you started off as an intern. And what what kind of? Because I think that this is like the real important kind of takeaway. Um, you know, my audience tends to you know like me want to make stuff, whether it's video games, whether it's movies, whether it's television, whether it's scientific you know experiments and in, in technology and stuff like that. Um, how did you, like, what kind of mindset did you put yourself in to push from being an intern who could just show up, get his credit and leave to saying, no, 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 I'm going to, I'm going to go above and beyond the original programming here. And I'm going to evolve myself into being an executive producer of this franchise. Like what, what was that mindset like? 
Well, initially, I when I even applied for the internship, um, it was for a TV television script writing, which I had no interest in. I was wanted to make movies. TV was for, I mean, TV, I didn't really didn't watch a lot of TV. Um, I, I did as a kid, and even then, it was you know Fantasy Island and Happy Days and stuff. Not right. you know, uh, state of the art for their time, I suppose. But TV was for losers. I mean, it it was movies was where it was at. But it was the Academy of TV Arts and Sciences putting on the program. It was um, I had heard it was very prestigious. And I thought, well, I'll, I'll, I'll apply. And I did. And I didn't get it. I became a finalist, but I didn't get it. So then I mm -hmm. became determined the, the following year, well, I'm going to apply again. Uh, and I got it that time. And I, I went into a couple of days before my internship started. It was the summer of 1990. And I watched... Uh, Best of Both Worlds Part One had was aired for the first time, which was mm. a very famous two-part episode that kind mm -hmm. of where the show really broke out. Yeah, and that's when I started my internship uh, bes between season, right at the tail end of season three, and the beginning of season four. It, in a matter of a couple of weeks, I realized holy shit, writing for television is something I'd never imagined that it was, uh, I don't know how they're doing this. I don't know how they're thinking so quickly. I don't know how this is all, all sitting in a writer's room with Michael Piller and um, it's Michael Piller and Ron Moore. I those are the only writers there at first. But yeah. I, just, I just remember thinking, oh, I have no idea. I had no idea what went into making television. Um, I would like to get involved with this. Um, I would like to stick around. I like it here. I like the show. I never once ever considered running the show. Sure. <laughs> uh, even when they told me I was going to be taking over Voyager. Yeah, which is incredible, man. It, you when know. Miller called me in and said, we're going to hand the show over to you. I was, I said, you're making a terrible mistake. Uh, <laughs> Did you really say that? Uh, no, I did not in so many words. But I was right, right, right. caught off guard. It wasn't. It wasn't my goal. Sure, sure. Um, I was just kind of happy to still be sticking around, you know. Uh, yeah. But uh, so I didn't have those ambitions, you know. I I just wanted to learn how to write, and that show was perfect for me. You used the word experiment. There's a lot of experimenting that was going on, and. Mm. It, on next generation and and could go on because of its format yeah um, that really appealed to me with with you know tng like i became so obsessed with tng um and um you know before i go there i i'd, I'd love to dig in just a little bit on why best of both worlds became this kind of pivot point for star trek the next generation because prior to that it was very good and you know even though there was like reservation about you know this older older he was he's probably younger than you know that i am now but the, you know this older captain he was in his 40s yeah yeah yes yeah. which so i'm you know <laughs> past my mid 40s right so yeah which is amazing but he was bald right and like we had kirk who had this beautiful head of hair and and like you know people took a little getting used to to picard now he's obviously an icon um but best of both worlds introduced i think a new menacing antagonist to the world of Star Trek that kind of even the playing field um, like in a way that like you know the light and the dark side of the force kind of do with like Star Wars for example and it gave a menacing enemy to a civilization that had everything and you know it it, it was such a special thing and do you, you got there right when that happened or do, do you see the reasons why it became so popular like in a different way? Well, first of all, when Rick Berman brought in Michael Pillar to take over the writing staff, and Michael brought in an amazing, put together a great staff, 
the writing improved. I mean, I don't know how else to say it. In season right. three, there was a radical shift in the quality of the writing, in my opinion. And I think a lot of people would agree. Right. Um, suddenly the scripts were, were tighter. The concepts were, were clearer and more fully realized. Um, it, there was a more of an emphasis on character. Um, enough cannot be said about my mentor, Michael Piller. Um, mm. Enough cannot be said for what he did, did for the show. In terms of Best of Both Worlds, it was the culmination of that new, improved season. And it, it had a great villain, as you say, um, kind of the antithesis of everything that we believe, the, the loss of individuality, the, the, just the, 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 the way they looked. Uh, it was just a cool villain. Mm -hmm. But it also did something that was just never done. Uh, it, it was a cliffhanger. Right. Okay, right. So that was a radically new idea back then. Sure, so sure. much so that they literally had to put at the end of the show to be continued. Dot, right. dot, dot. Like, like you would think otherwise. Like, right, right, you, right, you, right. You think, oh, God, that was a shitty ending to the series. I mean, that's how. And, couple... and if I can add one point to that, I'm sorry to interrupt you. Um, but beyond the cliffhanger, it's also one of the earliest signs of serialized kind of modern sort of television because there was an antecedent episode to best of both worlds that kind of sets it up. And, and right now I forget the name of the episode. But it's it's Q, Q who? Q who, exactly. Yeah. It, uh, and the Borg were, they're just cool idea. And, yeah. Um, and yeah, and they came back for another taste of humanity. And um, this right. time they were going to assimilate. And, you know, also I think, you know, we were always very careful to never, to, you can't, the stakes were very high. Not only was the captain assimilated, they were coming for Earth. Right. And right. you didn't have Earth at stake every week. If you did that every week, it would lose all of its impact. In right. fact, you very rarely saw Earth at stake, much less the galaxy or the universe. Like we sure. didn't, we tried to keep it grounded. The stakes were high. And that cliffhanger, man, like today, serialized television is, very, you know, they don't have to put to be continued on there, lest you be confused. Uh, <laughs> right. uh, and that really just got people going nuts. And but here's the kicker for me. It's mm -hmm. like they had to wait three months because right. we did 24 episodes, a year, 26 episodes a year, which is amazing. You know, you didn't wait. It wasn't the Sopranos where you waited uh, two or three years for the next season. Sure, they had the poor audience had to wait a whole three months, right, uh, which right. is very funny to me. But they, it, it just started a, a buzz, and this was pre-internet, you know. But there was a buzz, man. People, there was there were rumors that Patrick Stewart was was leaving the show, right? And um, would he be back? And uh, it just really caught fire. It was right. a moment because, of time, you know, because the 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 cliffhanger ends with with Lacutus of Borg, like I believe saying something something number one, and then that's when it goes to be continued, right? Like uh, he, the the last line is Riker saying, "Fire, fire." That's right. That's right. That's why right. he says number one, then Riker goes, "Fire." Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Picard is giving the 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 Borg party line. You will be assimilated. Resistance is futile. Yeah. Uh, but uh, yeah, fire. It, and I remember going back all the way to my NYU days. Um, the the example that they would give us is that Ron, and this is so. This is more of a legend in my life than a you know than a sort of verified reality. Is that Ron Moore, who eventually became the showrunner of another sci-fi masterpiece in Battlestar Galactica, um, was actually got his gig at Star Trek by submitting a screenplay and by going through this kind of process. Okay of like, you know, you know, the screenplay submission. What, what, when you were there, was this like a culture of people would, you know, like I've always wondered this, did, did, did you guys have a team that would actually read all of these scripts or was so, it kind of like luck of the draw? Like how did that really work? <laughs> well, Michael Piller had instituted this very unorthodox situation, um, which I'm, Paramount was not thrilled about because sure. 
you know, inevitably you'd get people saying, hey, that was my idea and or I had an idea in a script that you guys stole or whatever. And um, that would happen from time to time. And of course, that was never true. If there was ever any part, even part of a script that we were interested in, we would, you know, we would buy the story or premise from the writer. But that was sure. very, even that was very rare. Uh, two writers came in through the script submission pol uh, process, uh, Ron Moore and Renee Echevarria. Mm, Renee Echevarria. Ron, Ron Moore had submitted a script called The Bonding, which was made. And Renee had submitted something called The Offspring, which is mm. um, Data's daughter. Yeah, yeah. Which went on to become quite a popular episode. Um, and they just, they were standout scripts from very talented writers. Most of them weren't. Right. Uh, and the slush pile, as we called it, um, there were hundreds and hundreds of scripts. So my first job as an intern was to start reading those the submissions. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, and they slapped down a pile of <laughs> scripts, and I, ha you know, it was I had to both learn the show by watching it and reading actual scripts. Right. And then I was reading these submissions and looking for cool ideas or storylines or whatever. And um, yeah, and th that once I became a writer on the show, um, I, I didn't have to do that anymore. You know, it, that was, it was kind of the entrance job. And I know Michael would read them. Um, mm. and that policy went on until I think I, I phased it out eventually mm -hmm. um, during Voyager, I think. Like globally for the whole franchise? Just well, cer certainly, as far as I was concerned, just just because um, it, it was it wasn't reaping uh, as many rewards, I think, as problems. Right, right. It became too much uh, spam, so to speak. Like, even though, like, the notion of it is absolutely beautiful. This idea. Oh, oh, oh my God! It's fans writing these. Yeah, books. it's like open but, source fandom, like you know. Yeah. But um, yeah, and that's kind of Michael was always looking uh, for for new writers. I think you know he found a, a veteran writer in Jerry Taylor, mm. um, the great Jerry Taylor. But the rest of the staff was we were in our twenties, man. And he probably regretted having such a young staff. I mean, I know he was always looking for more experienced people, <laughs> right, right? You know, uh, but. Um, yeah, it was, a, it was a young staff, man. You know, um, so I mean, I could look. I could literally do a, a, a ten-part series just on TNG. But to sort of jump ahead to what I believe is the greatest episode of television ever made, and that's not something I say lightly. I'm I'm obsessive about you know these these sort of academia of television and all narrative whatever. But best of both worlds, I do believe. I'm sorry, uh, all good things. I do believe might be the greatest piece of television ever made because of what it means in terms of a finale, right? Even though the Breaking Bad finale is extremely good and there's other shows, you know, that have incredible finales. Actually, it's pretty much between those two. Um, what, what was that process? Like, I know that that's something that you worked on uh, uh, closely. Yeah. Ron, um, Ron Moore and I wrote that episode. Yeah. Yeah, which is like, you know, a huge, first of all, congratulations on that Hugo Award winning piece of, of, of television, which is rare, right? Like, you, you know, you're the only you're, TV show that at, at, up to that point that had won a Hugo Award was one time and it was the original Star Trek. Right, right. So this, I mean, we're I talking elite that. level uh, uh, sci-fi. Oh, yeah. I still have my Hugo Award. It's, I mean, it's, it's my proudest one. I mean, I, I mean, I love my Saturn Awards, but the Hugo Award it was something special. Yeah, and there's this moment um, which obviously ties into the beautiful work you did on Cosmos, but there's a moment when, when, and even Q and Picard talk about this, when Picard realizes the paradox of, of the thing growing backwards in time and all of this thing where he starts to make all these realizations. Um, like, how, how did you guys kind of come up with this and like, because, you know, sometimes finales, you know, have that issue where you're trying to cram too much in or leave too much out. And this finale, 
you know, down to the poker game at the end, which I, as a fan, was like, oh, my God, I didn't even realize that Picard never played the poker, you know? And it's just like, I mean, it, it literally is perfect television. What was that process of the ideation of it like? I mean, I have to tell you, and you've got to involve Ron Moore in this because he's going to remember stuff I don't remember. Sure. But it was a weird experience because we were also working on the the Star Trek Generations at the same time. Mm, so we were writing the first movie, which was introducing the crew to the big screen, but we were also writing the finale, which was its own thing because it was the end of seven seasons of the show. It was coming off the air at the height of its popularity. The ratings weren't declining. They were increasing. Right, right. And um, the ratings, you know, I don't remember the exact numbers, but, you know, or of how many people, for instance, watched the finale. But I think it was like, you know, 35 million people. My Lord. Can you imagine that today? Well, that's mm-hmm. a playoff, NFL playoff game number. You know? Right, 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 um, exactly. But, uh, it and, uh, but... We, the better two hour script was the finale um, because it was, you know, obviously only about one crew. It, it was weird because it was not difficult. I remember writing it, Ron and I in the room together writing, and it was just kind of, it was all clicking. Um, you know, I think I was interested in doing a kind of a Splatterhouse Five. Uh, mm. stuck in time thing which would allow us to go back to see the crew as we remembered them in the beginning of the series yeah man i just got chills on that one yeah it's so powerful just to, to see them now and to see how they might be in the future just seemed like a fitting way to end a show and again the science fiction format allowed for that you know and i was very interested in time travel at the time ron was a big advocate, as I recall, of bringing Q back and putting humanity, mm-hmm. resuming the trial. Right, yeah. the antecedent of encounter at Far Point to, right. to the ending. And- but, you know, it was a lot of fun to write. Um, it was, there wasn't a lot of controversy in writing it. I, I remember Michael Piller was really pushing for some subplot that I'd have to watch the show again that we, Ron and I pushed back on. But um, it just turned out really well. I mean, we were so in the groove at that point with the show. Like, it just, it, it was second nature. And we knew these characters so well. You know, the, the, I think the biggest controversy was what the last line would be, you know. and Oh, um, my God. Did you just give me chills again? Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> right? yeah. the last line is perfect. I mean, there is no better last line. Yeah, I don't. I, it might have been Ron that came up with it, but I remember Ron and I sitting with Rick Berman debating, I and mean, we had this list of alternatives. Um, <laughs> Joker's wild, you know, it, it all, right. you know. What would it be? But of course, sky's the limit is the perfect, the perfect, uh, the perfect line, and and it is yeah. a touching, you know, it's like such an intimate. It was a nice, and I remember being on the set when they shot the poker scene. It was just such a beautifully intimate moment. Um, it wasn't a space battle. It wasn't a, it was just the crew together right, right. And welcoming their captain and, uh, and into, you know, it was very touching. And well, it was you just, I just got a little emotional. I'm telling you, <laughs> this is that, that literally is one of the most powerful moments in television history. And, and like anybody who likes Star Trek knows that, you know, the uh, of all good things is like that is the epitome of Star Trek. You know, it, it's it's incredible. Yeah, it was. It really, I think, uh, undermined the first movie a little bit because right, right, right. it was so successful uh, on so many levels. I mean, we didn't know it would be, but it was. Um, I remember we screened the finale on the Paramount lot for the cast and crew and some press and it was a big screening. And I rem- I remember walking out and I could tell that people were crying, people were right. cheering, people were, and I was like, wow, they like this. Like this turn, 
oh, I guess this is good. I guess right. this this people are going to like this concept. People are going to like uh, the ending on the poker game. You don't know when you're doing it. And then, of course, Star Trek Generations, you know, really was a different animal. But um, as a two-hour movie, really couldn't measure up to the <laughs> the emotional yeah, impact of the finale. Because, you know, the, the thing is, and, and look, this is only my opinion, of course, but the the struggle that Star Trek has with the film format versus the television format is that Star Trek is so much about this kind of, um, you know, sort of introspection into the state of humanity and its relationship with knowledge, you know? And, and knowledge requires discipline and it requires uh, patience, you know? And, and like, there, there's, you know, especially from TNG forward, you know, there's a little bit more of that sort of wagon wheel in the stars thing to the original series. But, you know, the the TNG forward was really about teaching you like, you know, science, you know, and, and like the beautiful, the, you know, to be more specific, the scientific process, you know, of, of like you have hypotheses, how do you test it? How do you use that to make better predictions? It's, it's really deep stuff. And when you throw that to the movie screen, you know, you're, you're, you're now you're stuck in three acts. You have to have action. You have to have some horrible conflict. And the only Star Trek movie, I think, ironically, that really captures that is, you know, um, the, the original motion picture is kind of like that weird sort of like, you know, scientific, you know, method, method thing. And first contact, because it's so much about the core of what Star Trek is about, right? Which is like exploring strange new world in the it's first the time. Trek, I call, it's, a, it's the Star Trek, the, when the Vulcans land, that's the Star Trek nativity scene. It's the, exactly, <laughs> right, right. It's the three wise Vulcans. It's the, it, it, for the non-Star Trek fan, you walk out of that understanding what it's all about. Right. And it's a very interesting insight. I never thought about the problem solving that is going on, uh, particularly when they're confronted with a mystery. Sure. Um, and the scientific method is an underlying thematic element. I think uh, I'd never really thought of it that explicitly, but it's a good, it's a great, it's a great insight. Yeah. It, 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 and it's such an, ins like an inspirational, almost addictive, you know, content type, you know, because the more you watch Star Trek, the more you feel like you're better prepared at problem solving, you know, and that, and that's why, like, I like, you know, in in my uh, house down in the Florida Keys, which is my main sort of residence, um, I have every single piece of Star Trek on DVD, uh, just in case, right? Just in case something bad happens, because if I ever have children, I don't have children yet, but if I ever have children, they have to be able to watch that, no matter what, right? Like, no matter what licensing deals and what stream, you know, like. You know, like even if there's no electricity, I'll figure out a way that they can watch that because it is such an important lesson, you know, to uh, you know to learn. And so now, look, um, I can be pretty verbose about this stuff because I, I, <laughs> I love it so much. So I'm going to jump forward a little bit to kind of my sort of you know, like I won't necessarily admit this publicly a lot. Uh, but my favorite Star Trek is Voyager. You know, there's something about Voyager. Maybe it's because it was my intro point into Star Trek. And, and, and there's just something about the relationship between Janeway and, um, and, uh, and, and Tuvok and Janeway and Chakotay and Paris. And it was just, it, it just felt like a kind of, I don't know, there was just something a little younger feeling about it, you know, like a little bit more renegade. But somehow the Voyager spaceship is like the coolest looking spaceship and all that stuff. And, and, and I'd love to learn a little bit more about, A, you know, you guys had only made shows about the Enterprise, right? You had DS9. That was an interesting kind of gamble. Um, but then, you know, you took it back to its true roots, right? Into like, you know, this kind of lost in space, original series kind of vibe. How, how did you guys, first of all, just just to cut right to it, how did you guys design that damn Voyager, you know, spaceship? And it's such a, you know, the Intrepid class spaceship is so badass, you know? Like, how did you guys come up with that one? Well, you'd have to talk to Rick Sternbach mm. and um, Michael Okuda 
and John Eves, probably the, the people who were even Greg Jean, the model maker who just recently passed away, who built many of your favorite models. You know, back then we shot the model, you know, that was a full, <coughs> like a eight foot long um, model. And ILM would actually do do the special effects for you guys back then, right? They, they would do the the title sequences, I think, mm. uh, and some of the major sequences. But but uh, some some of it, yeah, some of it. But yeah. uh, um, I don't know. You know, I know that we wanted it to be a smaller vessel than Enterprise, um, uh, a little a little sleeker looking, um, but. I was not involved in the genesis of the design of the ship. Sure, so, sure. So I can't quite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No worries. It's just kind of like a, you know, it, it, it's kind of maybe a two in the weeds detail, but there's something. No, so it's not. I mean, look, we all have our favorite ships. I'm, a, I'm an Excelsior class guy. <laughs> uh, for whatever reason, I like, you know, the ship Sulu had in Star Trek VI. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, I just like the way it looks. I like the bottom. I like the way it looks. Although I think the best overall looking ship was uh the enterprise in star trek the motion picture that thing was gorgeous right right in the first motion picture the one yeah, yes one. yeah 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 it is very clean it is very clean you know one one of my favorite episodes um in uh in voyager first of all voyager is great and, and and you know casting janeway actually you know what let me like ask you about that because now it seems like you know like a normal thing but you know, back in those days, having your first sort of woman captain and look, Star Trek has always been ahead of the curve when it comes to like, you know, invisible, you know, boundaries. Um, but, you know, having someone like Janeway that basically had the gusto of a Kirk and the intelligence of a Picard and just like everything about her, the intelligence of a Spock, like how, how did you guys get to... A Catherine Mulgrew for that role. I mean, she is incredible as Janeway. Well, you know, Janeway also was a, first and foremost began her career as a scientist, mm. and that was an important aspect of the character as well. Um, and she ends up, of course, becoming this um, mother of this crew. I mean, you know, though we didn't pay a lot of attention to her gender, we she just we just wanted to make her a great captain. Yeah. Um, there was something that a lot that Kate Mulgrew brought to it. Yeah, yeah. That we, that we utilized. But um it was a, a it was a long, arduous casting process where we they for a long time were not finding the right person. Uh and they even started considering casting a man. Mm. Um I really strongly objected to that. I, I didn't want to work on the show if they weren't gonna make the, the captain a female. I mean, it had to be, it had, it had to be, that's, that's how it had to be. I mean, that was kind of like this promise. Right. Um, and you're, and you're right about, you know, Star Trek's um, inclusion of, uh, of, uh, of diversities of all kinds, not just uh, human diversity, uh, interspecies diversity, the whole mm -hmm. nine yards. And the secret to it all, of course, was that, to print, just to present it as that's how the future is. Sure. Not calling it, don't call attention to it. It's just is. Everyone that's what the past is also. That's how reality is. And that is how reality is. And um, that's a good point. Um, but we, you know, it's, a lot of people know that we cast uh, the original Jane Way was Jean-Via Bougeot. Mm. And we filmed for two or three days with her um, uh, before realizing it wasn't the right fit. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I was a big proponent of Jean Vieux As I recall, Rick Byrne was like, this is, he was a fan of hers too, but he's like, she's a movie actress. She's not a television actress. She's not prepared to be a, a working as much as she's going to work. Yeah. And, um, she lived in Malibu, which was really far away from the studio. Like, and he was right. Um, and uh, and she also was, you know, as a movie actress, really used to working with the director and crafting her character and taking the time. And that's not what TV directors do. Like, they're trying to get through their day. Like, 
you're the actor, you, <laughs> you act, I'm doing setting up their shots. It just wasn't for her. Mm. And after, you know, Bougeau dropped out, um, we had it, we screen tested a couple of actors. I don't want to say who the other actor was, but, uh, we screen tested an act, two actors, one of who, whom was, uh, Kate Mulgrew mm. and Kate just came in guns blazing. Uh, and was just obviously the right choice. And um, that was that. Yeah. And, and like, you know, for me, um, the thing about Kate Mulgrew that just like to this day, I mean, I'll, I'll rewatch Star Trek Voyager, you know, all the time. And, you know, with her, it's like she never, you know, she's obviously the boss. She obviously feels very kind of alone up there because she's got the responsibility of getting the crew home but she never loses her her femininity she never loses her kind of sexuality and you know and there's something very empowering about that you know that like she doesn't have to give up certain things about being a woman to be a great captain and you know it's all preserved all the time and like even there's this incredible kind of Sam and Diane, will they, won't they, at times, thing with her and Chakotay. But she always keeps it extremely professional, and so does he. And it's like, these are, you know, it's very complex sort of writing of these characters, you know? And, and you know, Voyager to me is, God, like, I hate to say it, but I think it's underrated. I actually think Voyager is an underrated show in the annals of Star Trek because, man, it is. It's pretty incredible. It's hard for me to find episodes I don't like. Well, look, when you're doing 26 episodes a year um, and you haven't written them ahead of time, you're writing as you go, they're not all going to be uh, A-plus episodes, you know? Right. Um, and, and I've written, <coughs> you know, I've written a, couple, a few howlers. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I think, you know, I really loved writing for Voyager. And, so, and some of my proudest Star Trek work is on there. And it it was a, a, a great show. I, I don't know. I, it got a lot of crap when it, you know, when it came out. And um, I don't know if it's just was franchise fatigue. I mean, of course, you know, it premiered to, I think, 19 million people watched the premiere. I mean, which is just not, by the way, on a, on a, net, on a brand new network with, limited coverage around the country like if if a show got the, those ratings now oh my god it, Back, it, like, it, it, it wouldn't <laughs> 10 years ago lost which was considered to be like you know probably one of the biggest television phenomenons we've had ever you know their highest episodes were like 13 million you know and and, and that was crazy um there's two episodes of voyager that i want to call attention to because i think they're both masterpieces of television one, I forget the name right now. I'm trying to look it up and I just can't can't find it. And I apologize for forgetting the name, but it's an episode where probably my favorite character in the show, Tuvok, um, is um, is hunting a criminal. And it's a very kind of Jorge Luis Borges uh, 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 script because he's actually hunting himself. And, you know, and, and you can see, do, do you not remember that one? No, it sounds great. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to, I was going to. I, I was certain I would be able to provide the title. I'm not sure I'd remember that one. Yeah, yeah. So um, there, there's been um, a a crime um, in the movie theater, in the holodeck turned into like a movie theater, and uh, Tuvok is investigating it, and he can't figure it out, and it's driving him crazy, and he eventually realizes that he's hunting himself, that like he's the one that actually committed the crime. How is um, and uh, God, I forget the name of it, but it's it's absolutely brilliant. And I you know, want to give you guys props for that one. And the second one, probably my favorite episode of Voyager, is one called Waking Moments. I believe it's called Waking Moments, where um, you, you guys ran across like a species that sort of attacks you in your dream. And, uh, you know, Chakotay is kind of like the uh, main focus of the episode. And he keeps tapping his wrist every time he sees a moon. And sort of he keeps waking up again, very Jorge Luis Borges, where he kind of keeps waking up like a dream within a dream within a dream within a dream. And, and it's just like these kind of, you know, um, literary themes that you guys bring in of the labyrinth of 
Are, are you familiar with Jorge Luis Borges? Uh, are you kidding? Of course. Okay, 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 of course. Of I mean, course. First of all, I apologize for that. For that. No, question. no. I mean, I mean, but you know, he had a huge influence on me. I mean, my a lot of my my concepts were, were reminiscent of some of his mind bending work. Exactly. And if exactly. anyone's li- watching this podcast, check out his work, Borges, B O R G E S. Yes, yes. And he's got two core books, one called Ficciones, the other one called Labyrinth. Um, you know, and uh, it's just a series of short stories. Yes. You know? it's, it's short, uh, yeah, short stories. And uh, but these episodes, like there's so many Voyager episodes that had a little bit of that Jorge Luis Borges, like labyrinthian yeah. mental, you know. It's interesting, like you're meant most people don't mention I've never heard those episodes uh mentioned in lists of favorites. Uh it's usually right. like Year of Hell or you know, something like, you know, more obvious. Um I remember waking moments. I don't really I don't remember the other one, but it's a good premise. Yeah. <laughs> I'm gonna look it up and I'm gonna email it to you because it's okay. a beautiful episode and it's one word you just like you fall in love with Tuvok. Because you 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 see the struggle of a man who refuses to admit that he's the problem, you know. And I have to tell you, I, I had just uh, watched. Um, it's interesting. I, out of all the shows of that era, Star Trek's still on, right? And I was flipping channels. There was Voyager. Mm. Um, I don't know what it was. It may be the BBC or something, but uh, it was an episode called Meld. I think from the first season where Tuvok mind melts with a psychopath. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I know exactly the one you're talking about. And um, to figure out why he committed a random act of violence. And not only is, I think, Voyager underrated, uh, Tim Russ is underrated. Extremely um, underrated. He's such a good actor, and he's he played such a great Vulcan. He's he, he's wonderful in in the episode Meld. He and I'm sure he was great in the episode you're referencing. Um, and and you know, he, he is the Vulcan. He is the Vulcan. I mean, him and Spock, obviously, uh, in Letter Nimoy. Yeah, but by like, way, the, worth noting, he's full Vulcan. He's full Vulcan. Yes. Okay. <laughs> That's a very Vulcan. good point. That's he's a very good Vulcan. point. You know, so he doesn't have the dichotomy going on, um, which makes him different. And um, there's a great scene that I, again, Voyager was on TV a, a few months ago, and I, Year of Hell was on, and it was there was some little tender little scene between Tuvok, who was blind, and Janeway, and they were saying goodbye to each other, mm. and it was a really tender moving scene well obviously well acted but it's like oh yeah they had a relationship that that meant something to people right like right that scene wouldn't work if they did i mean look the whole premise of the show really starts off with jane way going to rest you know to like bring back her 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 her, her uh her security officer right like she's going to bring tuvok back like that's her responsibility that's her that's ultimate a great that's her ultimate goal, or or not goal, but her ultimate motivation, is to bring Tuvok back home safely, because he's undercover with the Maquis. That's you right. Know, uh, you know, uh, yeah. Yeah, tu- Tuvok. Tuvok's an incredible, incredible character, and well, you should have Tim Russ on your show. Oh man, you know what? That's a, first of all, it's a very, very good thing, and I'm going to ask my talent booker to see if he can get him because Tuvok. You know, he's yeah, okay. he's he's one of my favorites. If you have any issues getting him, which I don't think you will. Uh, let me know and I'll make sure he, he he comes on. First of all, thank you very much for that. That's that's awesome. So look, I know we only have about 15 minutes here. Uh, that's um, fine. Keep you've going. been so generous with your time. But there's one thing I do want to talk about, man, because after watching this piece of content that you created and you directed, um, I started writing a screenplay that took up about three years of my life. Um, <laughs> and uh, And this is your kind of work on Cosmos. You know, uh, taking um, you know the work of the great Carl Sagan, this kind of you know, again, you know, you've worked on these beautiful shows that sort of have given all this respect to the scientific process. Something that between you and me, we don't have to get into it too uh, too much. is is a little bit kind of forgotten about you know these days about what science is really about, right? That it's not about 
that science is this monolithic piece of truth. Science is this evolving, changing set of you know data sets that are used to Which, make. By the way, the the enemies of science would would say is a weakness of science, but in fact, it, it, its greatest strength is that it well, corrects itself in the light of new evidence. It's not a weakness. That is the essence of biology. That is the essence of evolution. That is the essence of everything. That's the essence of intelligence, right? It's the ability to adapt to new sets of data. Yeah. And, a, and, and, and you could extend that analogy up to someone with a fixed set of beliefs has stopped thinking. Right, right. And uh, anyway, uh, it's, um, yeah. Anyway, and and look, I've had the pleasure of, of interviewing uh, Neil deGrasse Tyson before, and I, oh, I, I cool. even did a little documentary with him once. Not as good as yours, but you know, I've definitely been able to work with him um, and Bill Nye, the science guy, which I actually believe you're working with now, right? Yeah, we have a show coming out uh, August 25th on Peacock uh, called The End is Nigh. It's a science disaster show. <laughs> First of all, that's awesome. But the the interpretation of Carl Sagan's uh, Cosmos that you guys did I believe now it's almost been like seven or no, maybe pushing a decade. Maybe it's well, 2000, uh, the first one came out in 2014 and then we did another season that came out in 2000, uh, uh, yeah, like 18 or something like that. 19. No, 2020, right, right after the pandemic. Oh, right, right, right. Both, both were excellent, but the, the format that you guys created with this incredible evangelist of science with Neil deGrasse and these, awesome kind of dramatizations with this beautiful animation style um you know mixed in with like real world documentary footage like tell me a little bit about how all those pieces came together because it really melded in in such a great way well first of all the original co-author of cosmos andrean who was married to carl sagan uh was the driving creative force, you know, behind the new cosmos, you know, without her, I mean, she, she was carrying that torch and she mm. was, a, you know, and significant uh, creative contributor to the original. And um, so I was working with her, I was brought in by, by Seth McFarland to, to help out and Oh, that's my, right. My involvement became deeper than I would <coughs> it ever would. But you know, we had the original to to follow. Um, there was you know, but we had to um, bring it into the modern era with modern visual effects. We put a heavier emphasis on the ship of the imagination, mm -hmm. uh, which only only appears I think a couple of times in the original. We made it the kind of the uh, the the thing that. Neil's flying around in in every episode. We instead of doing live action recreations of historical stories, uh, we use Seth's mighty animation studio. Uh, oh, okay, that's where that came from. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, let's let let's do it that way uh, for a change. Yeah. And um, you know, it was an amalgam of different um, styles. Uh, in terms of you mentioned, uh, kind of like uh, existing footage. One of the mandates as far as I was concerned, was no stock footage or no existing documentary footage unless we're, it's absolutely necessary. 99% <coughs> of that show is original, is handcrafted. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was important because that sets it apart. You know, it it makes everything fresh and original, even though it's dealing with really the fundamentals of astronomy and the fundamentals of science. And it's really about critical thinking one thousand percent. And one, you know, I. If if nothing else, that's what I hope people, young people, take away from it because critical thinking isn't taught in schools uh, in this country, and one wishes that it was, because it's the best lens we have to see what's true and what's not true. You're right. You're right. It's almost like an immune system for the brain, right? That's like right. once you and that's what the original did for me because I was a huge fan. That came out when I was like fourteen. And that crystallized in my mind. That's what I took away from that original cosmos. I'm like, oh, that's the scientific method. That's what I 
kind of been edging toward, but I didn't know that as I, I needed this tool. I needed to be equipped with this. I get it now. It's so simple. Yeah. Um, and then once you have, once you've seen the world through a, a critical thinking lens, and I wish the word critical wasn't used because it sounds so negative, but you can never go back. Right. Right. But you know what? Um, it's like at NYU, my, my favorite, uh, um, sort of class. It wasn't really a class, but it, it but but it was a, a stage in class. Was the sort of constructive criticism um, with your peers, you know? And that was always, I think, where people would get the most kind of tense. But it but it was also the point where people would become the closest and 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 bond with each other the most, you know? When when you can shed away all of the sort of pretense and the ego and give somebody a criticism with the with the goal of being constructive with that criticism sort of you know the concept of critical thinking take you know is empowering you know more than it is you know something to be afraid of and and, and people today are so worried to to like offend each other that you're not allowed to have a lot of dialogue you know it, it, it's tough to test hypotheses um, because you can't really question too much. You well, know? People, you know, everything's politicized and, and, yeah. you know, even science is, and there's always science, you know, you strives to be apolitical, but it's impossible to, for anything to be apolitical. It's but, always been that way, right? But, but it gets, but it gets, it's come to the point where um, we're dealing with anti, anti-science movements, um, sure. which is uh, really disturbing. And, um, you know, that's why I'm so happy to be continuing to make science enter entertainment shows. Um, and I'm, oh, oh, for uh, sure. I'm lucky that they're letting me still do it because. Yeah, we, we, we all are lucky that, that, I, that you're still able to do keep, it. You know, keep, you know, make it engaging and entertaining. But the, the underlying message, you know, it, it, I just want to equip people with a way because, you know, to quote Andrean, it these days, especially, it matters what's true. Mm. Um, in, in a in a world where disinformation is uh, an everyday occurrence on a massive mm. scale, mm. how do you know what's true and what's not true? Right. We have a way. You know. Right. Right. But, and, and and I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. No. 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 Yeah. Because like I actually think that that way, you know, is dialogue. You know, I think that, you know, dialogue is a very important way to, like, understand that, you know, and compare data and show your findings. But sometimes you can't even share your findings because it doesn't align with what I'm already thinking is the right answer. There's a lot of uh, confirmation bias going on. You know, people, exactly. they have a position and they'll they'll take the evidence that supports their position and everything else they don't want to hear about. <laughs> yeah. There, there's one there's one moment in uh, the first cosmos that always kind of haunts me um and it's not even you know one of the biggest you know i mean there's so many amazing things you guys discuss in that show and this one is a, a cool one not one of the most amazing ones but um the the techniques were so good and it's when uh neil starts talking about how the wolf was domesticated into the dog um and you guys perfectly blend neil hanging out you know at a campfire you know, with like the kind of wolf coming into play and then with the animation of the wolf. And it's just like this blending of mediums that you guys pulled off in that show. Um, and now I, I make the connection with Seth MacFarlane and your work in Orville, um, which in my fever dream, uh, you know, yesterday I was watching uh, to go to bed and I was, <laughs> I was waking up with this, all this Orville stuff going on. Um, so, okay, so now I understand where a lot of these things are, are, are sort of, you know, blended in with each other. Um, so look, um, we're pushing an hour here. Let me, let me get to the Orville because um, to be perfectly honest with you, I didn't know you worked on the Orville until about three days ago. Um, you know, for me, Brandon Braga was always this legendary, uh, you know, showrunner, producer of Star Trek, you know, like, uh, 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 you know, legend and Cosmos. And I knew you had a ton of other projects, but when I started doing a little bit of research, I saw that the Orville was one of the shows that that you had EP'd and even directed. I actually saw one of the episodes that you directed last night. 
uh, that dealt with um, you know one of the crew members um, who's an all a male species uh, going through a gender reassignment for their you know newly incubated baby, which is hilarious by the way when he's sitting on the egg for the whole episode. But you know the the Orville is to me. I just got into it, so this is only my third episode. That okay, I've seen. well, you have a, you have an amazing adventure ahead of you. <laughs> yeah. Truly, like yeah. it, the show gets better with every successive episode. It, yeah. And this third season, try to avoid any spoilers. Um, you will be rewarded. And you know, one one thing that really blew me away. I've only seen three episodes, even though I think when I was sleeping, it went into like deep deeper episodes. But I only saw actual three. One thing that hits me the hardest is that the musical cues of the show are so reminiscent to the aesthetic of the way that music plays into the sort of mise en scene of, you know, Star Trek. And, and, and it's something that's so forgotten in some of the new Star Trek stuff, like this, the way that music was this kind of like character that reminded you, hey, take in the fact that there's a beautiful little spaceship leaving the cargo bay, you know, take in the fact that these two people are friends and they're sort of enjoying a walk down, you know, like the hallway of the ship. And, and, and is it, it's not the same composer as, as Voyager, right? It's totally different. But it's the same aesthetic, you know, when Seth created the show and we were designing the look of the show, it's an homage to, um, a certain kind of Star Trek. I mean, it's an homage mm. to kind of next generation, the way the ship feels, the, 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 you know, next generation and the other Star Trek shows did something that most shows can't afford to do these days is we had a full or orchestra and, right. and, right. A, and it feels and like a, it. And a composer composed music for each episode. Right. And that's Seth does that with the Orville. We have a 90 piece orchestra uh, with a, several different composers. And they're great pieces of music. And um, for all the reasons you're saying, you know, and it, it makes it more cinematic, it makes it more emotional. Um, yeah. And, and, and like, um, and look at this last episode, because, you know, not to say anything bad about the new Star Trek, I'm not, I'm not really a big fan of it. I don't really watch it too much. So I don't want to speak of something that I haven't seen because it's not fair. But the new Star Trek has become, which is, probably something that I would have done as well. So it's not a decision that I flaw, but it's become extremely serialized. Um, and this Orville, even though I've only seen three episodes, I'm getting the feeling that there's more of that return to the sort of procedural, sort of thematic, like, like you know, introspection about a single theme. Like this episode about the gender reassignment and how everybody reacts to it. So, you know, they have such a clear opinion of, of what's right and wrong, and then they're forced to question that opinion. That's what Star Trek is all about, right? Like taking these incredibly important and difficult questions and and having an opinion on it and then questioning that opinion. Is that even the right way to look at this? That's a very, very clear way to put it. Um, and, and hopefully, I'm not saying we're successful every time, hopefully these questions are we're not interested in hammering you over the head with the right or wrong answer. You know, mm. the, the best episodes are ones that are controversial, that um, have conflict amongst the crew, but don't settle the issue mm. and let, let it be discussed because, you know, we're not here to preach a certain point of view. We're here to explore um, human, you know, the human condition, yeah. oftentimes using in a highly effective way, aliens <laughs> uh, to, for, as a metaphor for ourselves. You know? Sure. Um, did, did, did Seth tell you about this idea as far back as the Cosmos days? I'm, I'm intrigued now about when, when you first well, heard the inception. We talked about, you know, he's a huge, I mean, he's, a, he's as much a Star Trek fan as you are. I mean, he mm -hmm. loves Voyager. He, I think next gen he'd say was his favorite. Um, and you know, he, we talked about doing a Star Trek series. Um, but like an actual one at one point. 
Yeah, but you know, for all sorts of different reasons, that wasn't going to happen. Sure, sure. Um, but I, you know, I remember he was talking about something this, and even like this, the the Mocklin species that you're referencing, the all male gender species, he had mentioned to me as a cool idea. And I'm like, yeah, that has a lot of possibilities. But it's really not till one day I got a call out of the blue, where he said, hey, I wrote this script uh, called the Orville. It's that thing that I've mentioned to you a few times over the years. Uh, it uh, uh, Fox just greenlit it to series. If, uh, the pilot hadn't been made yet. Uh, and he wanted me to come write on it. And That's so awesome. and at that point, I hadn't written Star Trek in a number of years. It might, you know, maybe 10 years. And I was like, do I want to do this? Can I still do this? And I have to tell you, it was the greatest thing ever. Mm -hmm. I missed the kind of storytelling you're talking about, the standalone storytelling. Mm -hmm. I missed optimism. I missed, um, I missed Star Trek and I missed the kinds of things it had. And the Orville is, uh, obviously a close cousin as is cosmos they're all about sure. all these things are about exploration and they all have a very optimistic view about humanity and what we're capable of the good things you know and they're where those shows are interested in building human self-esteem a lot of science fiction seems to be interested in in tearing us apart and to being dystopian mm. seth felt rightly especially at that time there was nothing like next generation on the air nothing positive and um science fiction wise and it was a breath of fresh air now i haven't seen the news i've seen some of the new star trek you know the thing to keep in you know mm. and, and although some of it's quite good and some of it's just not my cup of tea at all mm -hmm. um and a lot of it's a little too dystopian for my taste having said that you know you've got to I got to travel back in time and, and remember, remind myself that when I was doing Star Trek, people were shitting on it constantly. Oh, there was I, always, there were always people who liked it, but it, the most vocal people were the people who said Voyager sucks. 1000%. Even letters coming in talking about how next generation sucks. Right. There were plenty of people who didn't like that show. There, so there are always the haters out there. Right. Who say this isn't Star Trek? This is this, or this is bad Star Trek. Or right, because they have a preset bias in their brain, and anything well, that you know. And, and, and that's the thing too. It's like the Orville is very in, in one of the, another really important way. It's like Star Trek is that you never know what kind of episode you're going to get week to week, or who it will be about. And it's very mm -hmm. anthological in that regard. And some people like certain kinds of stories, you know, and some people prefer others. So you, ca you can't please everybody. And so it all, it, you got to, you know, I have to remind myself to be kind to these new Star Treks because they're just the same crap I went through, you know? Yeah. I had, um, uh, which I stopped doing about two years ago, but I had the biggest Star Wars podcast in the world, you know, um, you know, the numbers didn't lie. It was by far the biggest one. And I'm I'm what's known as like a prequel defender. You know, like I, I love the Star Wars prequels, but the Star Wars prequels were deeply, deeply hated. You know, like like it, it almost drove George Lucas to like never want to talk to a human being again, you know? <laughs> and like now people all of a sudden, everybody loves the Star Wars prequels, you know? Uh, well, not everybody, but a lot of a lot more people do than they did back in those days. And I've been very critical of the new Disney Star Wars movies, but I can't deny the fact that there's tons of people that love them, you know? And, and, and to your point, you, you, you have to be a little bit like, you know, accepting of the fact that there's other people that love it and that, you know, your opinion and their opinion can coexist, you know, like in the same place. And with the new Star Trek, um, like Captain Jean-Luc Picard is probably one of the most important, like literary figures, I think, in history, like, you know, period. And I haven't been able to bring myself to watch um, Picard, you know, like I saw one episode and all I remember is people screaming at Picard and calling him an idiot and all this stuff and him kind of you know, like take, and, and it just felt like he was being berated. 
um, and I kind of stopped, you know, and and I haven't given it a chance. Um, and there's two seasons. There's one that has Q in it, like like almost every episode. You know, it's like you couldn't have told me five years ago that that would exist out there, and I wouldn't have seen it already. You know, I think that, uh, yeah, I mean, they're they're. It's just so hard to say. I mean, I. I don't want to comment on it. Um, yeah, yeah, no, no problem. No problem. I haven't, like you, I haven't really seen enough of it to, to, to have yeah. any kind of opinion. But it, it, you know, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no worries about that. No worries about that. I totally get it. Uh, like on a positive note, I've heard a lot of people say that Strange New Worlds is really, really good. Well, um, that's a, yeah. I've seen. I have seen the first three episodes of that and that's a return to standalone storytelling and oh that's cool it looks great and it has it's fun and it has it's more i think what people some people not all hmm. um yeah there there are lots of people who love star trek discovery oh yeah yeah I you know, know i know some of them they think captain Lorca, whatever his name was a very interesting character and you know but, but it's like you know, and some people hate it because it's, you know, it's, it's just, you know, Star Trek, like Star Wars, is going to be generational. You know, I look at the history of Star Trek and I look at whose hands it was in and whose hands it's been through. Sure. And um, it went through my hands for 15 years. It went through Gene Roddenberry's. Nicholas Meyer had his stab at it and put his mm -hmm. imprint on it. Um, and and so on and so forth and it's it's a big enough world that it, it it's just taken on a life of its own it's it's so like the last time i was at a star trek convention in pre-covid days it's it really struck me how you know however many people were in the room 20 or at the convention twenty thousand people yeah yeah I'm looking around and i'm like ever all of us have a shared history it's 1, not real. It's a fictional, but any one of us is conversant in this history, in this Star Trek universe. And, um, and it was just really heartwarming. I'm like, and, and oh, really, yeah, yeah, I love Star really, Trek conventions. Cool. And I've seen yeah. families with kids, and you know, you know, the, the, the parents are, are trying their best to in, get the kids into it, and some of them take yeah. to it, some of them don't. Uh, and um, I think. It's a really, it's. It, I think it's a really cool thing about Star Trek. And you know, what, what, one sort of this is my last thing um, because I, um, I'd be remiss if I didn't bring this up because I'm also a very big fan of this show, and that's uh, Star Trek uh, Enterprise. And I know that you also worked on that. And um, the one thing about Enterprise that always kind of um, shocked me, but I think is such a great decision. Um, after you actually see the output, is using somebody as famous as Scott Bakula as the captain was very counter kind of intuitive to the trend of how you guys would cast the core crew. Uh, because, you know, even though Patrick Stewart had been in The Elephant, or, or maybe not yeah. uh, Dune, um, and, you know, he had a little bit of a name, but not really. Um, you guys... With Scott Bakula, he was pretty famous, right? Uh, you know, Quantum Leap was a, a legendary, you know, science fiction show. Yeah, he was a TV star. Yeah, yeah, now, he was a TV star. That was Kate Mulgrew. Not, you know, she was Mrs. Columbo. Now, that was... Sure. But, but, but I think Scott, one could argue, was more prominent. Um, I, I, I questioned it myself for the same reasons. But Scott was such... I mean, it, we knew it was going to be hard to find a kind of that Chuck <clears throat> Yeager right stuff vibe. And he, Scott had it. He really does. He and, really um, does. And, and he's, and he's just such a likable persona. And I really believed that he want, he was trying to do the right thing, but, but was facing these, you know, the Vulcans weren't wrong. They really weren't ready. Mm. And Scott had to lead them anyway. Another thing, and I thought it worked out great. The most controversial part of Enterprise when it was on, and still to this day, which I'm baffled by, is we decided to make the Vulcans because it was way earlier. Mm -hmm. 
right and it's soon after the events in the movie first contact kind of these antagonists that were babysitting us and and kind of holding us back sure for our own good which is a great narrative uh, uh you know device and people a, lo a lot of fans vocalize that those aren't that's not vulcans that's not what vulcans are and i'm like well but that's what they were then sure like you just want that our relationship got better kind of but um i thought it was one of the great inventions of the show um and uh made perfect sense oh and it, and it was a perfect um continuation of that look that you get on the Vulcan's face in first contact. I mean, that that Vulcan doesn't seem like he's <laughs> trustworthy of the people that he's looking at. Well, that's what we we're kind of taking our cues from. It's like, well, what what happened? You know, right. well, what happened was they realized we we'd gone to warp, but our planet was it had some kind of terrible war that's just happened. Sure. But now it's we've revealed ourselves. It's too late. But we we can't let them do this on their own. They're gonna they're gonna get in big trouble, um, and uh, I, I, that was my favorite part of the show. Um, and by the way, one another show that got a lot of I mean that one was brutal, you know. What Enterprise, huh? Yeah, I mean again, premiered. because you only did four seasons, which it broke that seven season streak. Well, that first of all, we did ninety nine episodes. I mean that's. That's, That's a, a lot, lot of episodes for any TV show. So, sure, sure. But the the seventh season, no, no one, there was no law that said <laughs> right, the right, season right. was the benchmark. Right. Um, it it did end too soon. It should have had a couple more seasons because we there was plenty of material we had left that we wanted to do, and um, that's a whole other story involving uh, the new network that took over and or the new sure. leadership and it was you know a whole other issue but um but again that show premiered to very good numbers but people at that point were like okay another star trek voyager just ended here comes another one right right on its heels and i think the audience was right to say is it more of the same is it as good is it better and so that came under heavy fire Mm. And I think now people look at it more fondly. I mean, I if you haven't seen Enterprise, you have 99 episodes of, of, of Star Trek, of Star really Trek made by the same people who made Next Generation. So if you yeah. like that kind of Star Trek, yeah. it's the same writers, it's the and, same producers. <laughs> and look, one thing that I remember about it, because um, I remember that I saw the... Um, I believe was it the premiere episode? I think it was the premiere episode, um, and um, I was working for the Chicago Museum of Modern Art, and I was like doing this like interactive exhibit um, at the uh, Chicago Museum of Modern Art. And as I was headed to Chicago, um, you know, nine eleven happened, and um, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong, the first episode aired around that time right it was like right before or right two after week, uh a week or two right after yeah yeah which 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 must have like also you know television ratings must have like completely been in a weird oh, flux it, yeah, it, it was just yeah it was i mean you know we we shut down production and no one was really thinking at that point about anything except what had happened um but um, it, it sent shockwaves um, through the tele, through our our show, which would eventually pick up some of the themes um, in season three. Right in a really interesting way. Um, and of course, and ironically, after, after Enterprise, I would go work on start writing for Twenty Four, which right. is a direct <laughs> result of the events of nine eleven. Uh, but uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and um um on Twitter. Yeah, anyway, man, this has been so much fun, man. We're, we we've we've run over. I'm, I'm, I'm glad. You, I'm glad. <laughs> well, have me back, this. man. I'll tell you what. You have so much great shit coming your way on the Orville. I mean, don't That's let great. anyone spoil. What's avoid any knowledge of what's coming in seasons one, two, and three. 
Okay. Because there's some great surprises. And, and season three has like a different name, right? Like um, I did oh, or, see. Okay, you know, don't, don't tell me. Don't tell me. Don't tell me. Because like on Hulu, which is how I've been watching it, no commercials, so very very good experience. I noticed that you had three seasons, and three is like only like four or five episodes. No, it's going to be ten. Okay, but so it's mid it's mid season right We're now. Very right? week to week. Yeah. Okay. Cool. That's cool. called. It's just called Orville New Horizons. Uh, okay. Uh, but. As a fan of the kind of Star Trek that you like, I, I, you are in for um, a treat. You really are. Cool, man. I'm I'm excited. I I so felt that last night. You watched the Orville. Have me back on to talk about it. Okay. First of all, that's so cool, man. I I, I really appreciate that. After I finish the all three seasons, I will reach out again and we can chat about it. That would just focus cool. in on that and. Um, I'm going to take you up on your offer to get Tim on if I can't get him myself. Um, I'll tell you what I'll do is I'll send you his email. Oh, well, you know what? He might. No. Well, you, use use your talent booker. If you ha do your normal thing, if you run into trouble, tell me and I'll get I'll, I'll pick up the phone. All right. Cool. He's Brandon Braga, the legend. Um, you know, uh, meeting you has exceeded all my expectations, sir. Sometimes you do want to meet your heroes because you can learn some good stuff from them. Brandon, sir. Well, I learned some stuff from you. You had some really, really uh, great insights. Oh, cool. Well, I'm humbled by that. Thank you so much, sir. Thanks, man.